And so this will be my first look at Blue Book Test 5. So I'll do one video each for Reading and Writing Module 1, Module 2, and then Math Module 1 and Module 2 will get their own videos. This will be done in real time here. So, number one. According to a team of, and let me zoom in a little bit, according to a team of neuroeconomists from the University of Zurich, ease of decision making may be linked to communication between two brain regions, the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex. Individuals tend to be more decisive if the information flow between the regions is intensified, whereas they make choices more slowly when information flow is not intense, less intensified, reduced. Okay, reduced. And next. Okay. Ecologist Ezequiel Escura and colleagues found that inhabitants of the Mexica Empire used natural landmarks to track time with a high degree of blank. So a high degree of what? Probably something like precision, but let's read the next sentence because there should be a clue there. So by observing the sun's pro position in relation to various points on the mountains, they were able to, yes, precisely identify the dates. So that's going to be our clue. Precisely identify the dates. That means they could do it with a high degree of precision or exactitude. And I'm realizing I didn't say anything about the other words on the previous question. But with the time ticking, I have to be a little quicker here. But precarious means, you know, if something is in a precarious position, it's sort of like a dangerous, unstable position. Resilience. If you're resilient, you can put up with challenges. Inconspicuousness means not vis visible. If something is conspicuous, it's visible or easily seen. Okay. In this book, so-and-so identifies an increasing sense of something feminist mode of writing in contrast to many woman-authored science fiction stories whose politics were less deliberately signaled. Okay, so if we have a contrast, and the second part of the contrast talks about something being less deliberate, this is going to be deliberate, deliberately feminist overtly so overtly deliberately out in the open not disguised prudent means careful cordial means polite and inadvertently means unintentionally KD Lecca and colleagues found that the Sun's corona provides an advanced indication of solar flares, intense eruptions of electromagnetic radiation that emanate or spring forth from active regions in the sun's photosphere, some region of the sun, and they can interfere with telecommunications on Earth. Preceding a flare, the corona temporarily exhibits increased brightness above the region where the flare is. Hmm. Uh, forming? Let's see. Let me try that again. The sun's corona provides an advanced indication of solar flares, intense eruptions that emanate from active regions and can interfere with telephic communications on Earth. Preceding a flare Okay, they exhibit increased brightness above the region where the flare is. Okay, where the flare is forming, okay, an impending. Okay, we can do a little bit of elimination here. Innocuous means harmless, and that's definitely a word to know because it's shown up on other answer choices or in, other, in the answer choices to other words and context questions on other tests. Perpetual. Well, perpetual means it's going on forever, and this says here that solar flares are eruptions. If something erupts, it's not perpetual. If it's erupting, it's coming into being. Antecedent means something that comes before something else, and I can see some students maybe wanting to pick antecedent, but 
impending is going to be the better word here because impending like impending doom an impending incident i'm taking too long on this one with the the ticking clock here but uh they emanate from yeah they emanate uh, yes i if i have time i'll come back and give a better explanation but impending means that it's about to erupt okay main purpose so want to really make sure to, that we're focusing on this portion. I know that you can see that over there, but I'm not looking at that. So we want to read this and think about summarizing it in three to five words, what it's trying to do. So the narrator is a young college student writing letters detailing her weekly experiences. The college is organizing the freshman basketball team, and there's just a chance that I shall make it. I'm little, of course, but terribly quick and wiry and tough. While the others are hopping about in the air, I can dodge under their feet and grab the ball. So she's saying why she thinks she'll make the basketball team. And I know that's in more than three words, but she's saying why she thinks she will make the basketball team. So not comparing it, not talking about how to play basketball, not stating how other players will be chosen, but to explain why she thinks she might make the basketball team. It's that simple. It's that simple on these questions. Read, think about summarizing it, and you will probably have a really good head start on the answer. So let's do that again here. Researchers have hypothesized that woolly mammoths were hunted to extinction in North America by humans using spears with grooved tips known as Clovis points. Okay, so researchers have hypothesized this. Why have they done so? Uh, let's see, one, hypothesis, anth one anthropologist set out to test this hypothesis using a mechanical spear thrower. He launched, launched spears with Clovis points into mounds of clay, substitutes for the animal's large bodies. The projectiles generally penetrated only a few inches into the clay, an amount insufficient to have harmed most woolly mammoths. This led the anthropologist to conclude that hunters using spears with Clovis points likely weren't the principal drivers of the extinction. Okay, so basically what they're doing here is um, highlighting evidence that contradicts this hypothesis. I don't want to say refutes the hypothesis, but uh, challenges the hypothesis. So A, I don't think it's, I don't think A is going to be correct because I don't think this is arguing for one thing. I think it's more summarizing, summarizing than arguing. And the other thing is, they're not really talking about an ongoing debate. They're just saying that they used to hypothesize this. They're not really saying anyone debated it. They're not focusing on the methods in the experiment, so it's not going to be B. They're not summarizing two competing hypotheses. They're describing an experiment whose results cast doubt on an established hypothesis, D. Okay, what do some historians suggest about Maya civilization? So this is an explicit detail question. So we're just going to read with that in mind. So this is different from a main purpose question. We just have this one detail. Uh, although suggest means we have to sort of infer as opposed to just identify the detail right there on the surface. So, <laughs> interesting. Well, I mean, according to the text means explicit detail. Suggest implies inference, but they're asking what historians do suggest. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, anyway, uh, the ancient writing system used in the Maya kingdoms of southern Mexico and Central America had a symbol for the number zero. The earliest known example of the symbol dates to more than 2,000 years ago. At the time, almost none of the writing systems elsewhere in the world possessed a zero symbol. And here it comes. The use of zero in Mexico and Central America may be even more ancient. Some historians suggest, okay, yes, what do they suggest? That Maya mathematicians inherited it from the Olmec civilization. What is it? What is it? Z the use of zero. Maya mathematicians inherited or acquired the use of zero from the Olmec civilization. Yeah, so this is 
yes, this is an explicit detail question, and this is what we expect on an explicit detail question. We expect our answer to be explicitly stated. They might use, and they probably will use, some synonyms, but it should be, you shouldn't be left asking yourself, did I find the answer? You'll know when you found it. So it doesn't say anything about B, it doesn't say anything about C, it doesn't say anything about D. Okay, main idea. So with this one, we're back to um, what we were doing on the main purpose question, and that is trying to summarize it in three to five words. It's just that here, um, those three to five words are going to focus on the main idea, what it's saying, more so than what it's doing, which would be the uh, task we would try to carry out on the main purpose question. So, a subject of much speculation, distinctive sets of parallel ridges mark the icy crust of Europe. Jupiter's smallest moon. Researchers now claim that the ridges formation mechanism, the, the formation mechanism of the ridges, mirrors that of a strikingly similar pair on Greenland's ice sheet. Okay. Parallel ridges on, on the crust of a moon of Jupiter, and there's a similarity between that and something in Greenland. Okay, so there, surface water seeped through fissures or sort of cracks in the sheet and formed a water pocket that subsequently disrupted the overlying ice, forcing fragments of it upward and outward into peaks as the pocket froze and expanded. Although Europe, Europa, lacks liquid surface water, the same process could be driven by the moon's subsurface ocean. Okay, the moon in this case is Europa. Okay, so it's okay. One thing is, it's not certain. It's saying what could be true. It's it's highlighting a similarity between something in an ice sheet in Greenland and something in Europe. And yes, that's more than five words. Highlighting similarity between ice sheets. Okay. A, when I see the word same, that makes me pause. Because same, I'm going to say, is an extreme word. And extreme words are red flags. Same, why is it same extreme? Because two things can be similar without being the same. And we notice here, it just says, okay, it, the formation mirrors that of a similar pair on Greenland's ice sheet. But Greenland... But, but, it, otherwise A looks pretty good. So let's, let's look at the others. The primary difference, okay, B is too narrow. B is too narrow to capture the main idea. That's a, more of a supporting detail, if it's even accurate. C, uh, they're not focusing on when they formed. They're not focusing on when they formed, and then D... And it's not focusing on what researchers don't understand. So even though that's a little bit of a, a potential red flag, uh, it is supported. So it says here that green, uh, Europa doesn't have surface water, but it, hey, there's the word, same process. Okay, yeah. So if we're going to pick an answer with a with an ex so-called extreme word, it needs that uh, equally strong evidence to back it up, and that's what we do. We we do have that here. So yes, we're going to pick A. Another main idea question. So, to understand how Paleolithic artists navigated dark caves, archaeologist so-and-so, that's a strange name, uh, their first name at least. Um, is that a typo? I don't know. Um, I've never seen an exponent in a name. <laughs> I guess it's not an exponent, it's a superscript. Anyway, this archaeologist and her team tested different lighting methods in a cave in Spain using replicas of artifacts found in European caves with art. They use three different, so it's summarizing a, mm, kind of an experiment. They use three different Paleolithic light sources, determining that each likely had a specific purpose. For instance, the team learned that animal fat lamps were less useful than torches while walking because the lamps didn't illuminate the cave floor. Okay, so it's 
recounting an experiment and uh, giving a brief overview of the findings. Speaking of extreme words, essential. Okay, that's an extreme word, and we don't see anything that supports that. And that's really the idea behind why extreme words tend to be red flags. It makes a really strong claim. The passage needs to make an equally strong claim in order to support it, and it doesn't here. They discovered that they use... Okay, it doesn't say anything about the frequency with which they used the lamps. It just says that they had different purposes. It wasn't... It's not emphasizing that they were reluctant to draw conclusions. They learned some details. They learned some details. Some is a very... Uh, is a good word for, for uh, answer choices. More so than, you know, it's a very moderate word. Uh, and uh, it doesn't guarantee that the answer choice is right, but you're much more likely to have a correct answer with some in it than you are with a, an extreme word like essential. Okay, data from the graph to support the underlying claim. So we want to read this, understand the underlying claim, then go to the graph uh, afterwards. So a student is researching the trends in the topics submitted to a national science fair for high school students. The graph shows the number of submissions by topic that were made each year. Based on the data in the graph, the student claims that, okay, there were more medicine and health research topics submitted in 2019 than in any other year. Okay, yeah, there were almost 300 in 2019 and less than 250 or fewer than 250 in the other years. I mean, AA is not even relevant at all. Uh, yeah, the highest number of medicine and health submission topic submissions is approximately 285 in 2019. I mean, if they're making a claim about medicine and health research topics, we're not compare. We don't want to mention other categories. So. That's not the hardest of one of those questions. We'll probably see harder ones in Module 2. Okay, which quotation most effectively illustrates the claim? So, the, she prefers her hometown to other places she has visited. Okay, so usually on these quotation questions, I say you want to find like two parts and have the answer choice map onto it. So, the two parts here would be, first of all, that she does prefer her hometown, and not just that she likes it, but we're comparing it to other places she has visited. So not places she's lived, but places she has visited. So we don't have a comparison in A. B. Yeah, it's going to be C. I have had a great deal of journeying, visiting, and taken great delight in it, but I have never taken greater delight delight than in my rides and drives and tramps and voyages within the borders of my native town. So that is going to be C. Again, the important thing here is to have some idea of what we're looking for when we start to comb through the answer choices. It makes it quicker. Okay. A and here I'm going to need to pick up the pace because the clock is ticking. Okay. Which response from a survey, and here I'm going to do something I would do on the actual test, and that is to come back to these potentially time-consuming questions after doing the standard English conventions transitions and uh, rhetorical synthesis. And I will need to speed up given the time here. Okay, so what are atmospheric rivers and how do they affect our weather? So here, how do they affect our weather? So we're forming a question here. And I can link to a video I made about asking or formulating and punctuating questions to say more about that. Here we've got possessives and plurals, so the clashing of cultures that happens when uh, it, the movie, so we need the possessive pronoun, and that's going to be I-T-S without an apostrophe. So that means it's got to be either B or D. And then two protagonists. Protagonist is merely plural, it's not possessive, so we don't want an apostrophe, so that one is going to be D. Her novel, a fictionalized account of the lives of the Mirabelle sisters, 
comma can serve as a starting point for those wanting to explore how the rule of this dictator has been represented. So here we're punctuating an interruption. Why is this an interruption? Because if we took it out, we would have a complete sentence. Her novel, In the Time of Butterflies, can serve as a starting point. So it's going to be C. Uh, some kind of punctuation question. The vessel took six days to dislodge, comma, in part due to its sheer size, colon. It's as heavy as 2,000 blue whales when fully loaded. Okay, so we definitely need a comma before in part, but we don't want a comma after in part. And then C would yield a comma splice because it's as heavy as 2,000 blue whales when fully loaded. That is an independent clause. We can't follow, we can't join. I could say more about it if we have more time, but that one is going to be, did I give an answer? It's going to be B. It's going to be B. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a dangling modifiers question because when you have really long answer choices like this, it's going to be a dangling modifier question most likely. So what's our modifier? This portion, woven from recycled yarn and hand tufted using a carpet weaving technique passed down. Okay, so what was woven from recycled yarn? Not the artist, not when, and not the person. It's going to be these tapestries. So woven from recycled yarn, these tapestries are so lush and inviting that you want to reach out and touch them. Okay. Jamaican British artist so and so is known for his remarkable micro sculptures. Creations so small that they are best viewed through a microscope, his sculptures are made from tiny natural materials such as spider web strands. Okay, so this is a boundaries question. Uh, we want to make note of where we have independent clauses versus other sentence parts. We don't want to have run on sentences or fragments. Uh, the independent clause is here. That's one of them. And then that's the other one. Up to and including micro sculptures. Since we have multiple independent clauses, we need more than just a comma. And only C gives us that. Transition word. So, af okay. So we have a sequence of events. It begins this way. Then this happens. Finally, this happens. And I would take more time but the clock is ticking there's only 842 left okay Frank Zamboni developed an ice rink resurfacing machine as Zamboni's machine moved along the rink surface it's first scraped off the okay so this is just like the previous one we have a sequence it's just that in this case we're doing the middle you know it first did this next that lastly that inventor Lewis Latimer improved upon at Thomas Edison's design for the electric light bulb. And then they're going to, okay, they're making a general claim and then they're going to get more specific. Specifically, he made the light bulb more durable. So how did he improve upon it? He did this stuff. Okay. Continuing here, catching up so that we have time to go back and do those other questions. So this sculptural object an Everlast brand exercise bag embroidered with multicolored beads and a fringe associated with the dances of these Ojibwe people. Uh, stitches together recognizable symbols from both Native and non-Native American cultures. Blank. It also blurs. Yeah. In so doing, I would always avoid conversely because um, it's a very hard one to use correctly. And I just don't think they would ask you to do it. Uh, for instance means an example, but this is not an example. In, it's not getting more specific. It's saying what it does. In doing this, in stitching these things together, it also blurs this distinction. So I've never seen in so doing as a correct answer, but it is correct here, and maybe I should say more about that in a separate video. But here, I want to emphasize on these questions, it's all about this portion. We don't generally need the stuff on the left side of the page. They want to emphasize a similarity. So, both. They want to emphasize a similarity. Both of them did that. Explain an advantage. 
provides more access to the materials without removing from their countries of origin. And that's it. Explain an advantage of its being digital and uh, by offering online versions, that's digital, it provides more access and that's an advantage. And then a quotation to support a claim about Tharp's contribution to rock and roll. Had a major, so it's got to have a quotation. So it can't be A or B. C had a major impact on rock and roll that so and so called her uh, the unquestioned founding mother. But does that support it, the claim? It's got to be C because the only thing that talks about that there are only two that give a quotation. And this doesn't say anything at all about rock and roll. And so we're going to go back and do these three. And now we've got five and a half minutes. Okay. So a response given to shoppers who made a purchase at a retail store to support the researcher's explanation. So what is the researcher's explanation? External shopping cues are a marketing type that uses obvious messaging to entice consumers to make spontaneous purchases. In, in a study, this data scientist found that this effect can also be achieved with a less obvious cue, rearranging a store's layout. The researchers explained that trying to find items in new locations causes shoppers Okay, so here's their explanation, that trying to find items in new location causes them to move through more of the store, exposing them to more products, and increasing the likelihood that they'll buy an item that they hadn't planned on purchasing. Something that supports that. I needed to buy some cleaning supplies, but they weren't in their regular place. That's always nice when A is a very clear, clearly correct, because given that we're short on time i'm not going to read the others but this is this supports it they bought something that they didn't, didn't plan to buy because of the rearrangement logically completing the text so even with the widespread so we're just going to follow the line of reasoning here as we read this so even with the widespread adoption of personal computers many authors still choose to write and revise their novels by hand and only then transcribe the final version on a computer it may be tempting to speculate about how a novel written this way would be affected if it had been exclusively typed instead, but each novel is a unique entity resulting from a specific set of circumstances. Therefore, we can't speculate or we shouldn't speculate about that. Therefore, we shouldn't speculate about hand, how handwriting might change the outcome of a novel, something like that. So definitely not A. It's not, it's not going to make a recommendation about what they should do. Authors who do most of their work and revising likely by hand have more... No, it doesn't say that one has more success than the other. There is no way to reasonably evaluate how a work would be different if it had been written by other means. Yes, because each novel is a unique entity resulting from a set, specific set of circumstances. So what can we say about this? Again, follow the line of reasoning. Uh, don't draw conclusions about things that aren't mentioned or distinctions that aren't made or vari involving variables that aren't brought up or factors that aren't brought up. And go with a, you know, a cautious conclusion that can, or uh, if it's not a conclusion, whatever, something that supports what they're saying. I don't know. Um, I've got more videos on logically completing the text questions, and I can say more about these later, uh, but we'll do this one so that we don't run out of time. Okay, so these behavioral ecologists recently examined the behavior of field-collected and laboratory-reared bold-jumping spiders. They found a positive association between experimental high-protein diets and aggressive behavior. So I would write this down, you know, as... Uh, high protein diet and aggressive behavior they correlate okay and then there's also a positive association between high fat diets high lipid diets and aggressive behavior in lab reared males okay so this is field ones they collect in the field these are ones that they reared or brought up in the lab additionally field collected spiders showed a preference for flowers manipulated to display ultraviolet fluorescence whereas lab reared spiders show a, showed a preference for flowers dyed with red food coloring that was not fluorescent okay so there's differences 
there are differences between field collected and laboratory reared spiders. Do the rearing conditions affect their responses to experimental stimuli? Possibly. Possibly, because they behave differently. The lab-reared ones behave differently than the ones in the field. But let's see. Being raised in a laboratory? No. No, it doesn't. We don't conclude that because that second part of it doesn't say anything about aggression. And both of them show aggressive behavior. It's just that different diets have a different effect. See, laboratory settings are more suited. Nope. Nope, it doesn't make that distinction. An experiment should make use of lab. No. The only thing that we can really conclude here is that whether they were raised in the field versus in the lab, that makes a difference because you have different correlations. And so that one would be A. And I didn't flag any to come back to. I did say that there were a few I wanted to say more about. But time is ticking. So on a time management note here, I'll just you know emphasize something that I've said in other videos, and that's basically what I did here. And that is, you know, sometimes it can get a little stressful around the middle of the the reading and writing portion because you you've got these long questions. Um, but that do what I did there. Skip them. Come back to them at the end when you know that you have time.